Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming along today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and pay respect to all Indigenous elders past and present. Now, today we're venturing into some relatively new territory. Um, the, the Senate has been in the Twitterverse for some time, um, along with countless other peoples. And we thought it, that it was high time that we looked at in one of these sessions at the whole relationship between social media, political journalism, um, and people's perceptions of the parliament. And we thought we'd really liven it up today by having two presenters. And I'm sure they're both well known to all of you. We've all, all read their work on, um, on the various uh, websites. Now, going first today, uh, it's a, a great pleasure to welcome Judith Ireland. She's a journalist in the Fairfax Media Bureau here in Parliament House. You might be familiar with the Pulse blog that she writes. Um, and. Uh, she covers the day in politics live. And you know, when I get back to my office from being in the Senate chamber or, or at a committee hearing, it's interesting to see how Judith's interpreted the events that I've just participated in or been a witness in. Yes, I'll, I'll try and speak up, thank you. Um, so Judith and the ph photographic team of Alex uh, Ellinghausen and Andrew Mears uh, produce The Pulse every day. Uh, and our second speaker is uh, Greg Jericho, who's a political blogger. And he currently writes for The Guardian Australia and The Drum. Um, he's the author of The Rise of the Fifth Estate, Social Media and Blogging in Australian Politics. And I guess there are lots of interesting arguments to have about whether this movement warrants being uh, called the Fifth Estate. And he's formerly a public servant and researcher on the ABC program, dare I mention it, The Hamster Wheel. So I'm sure you're going to uh, be very well entertained this afternoon. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming, first of all, Judith Ireland. Look, thanks very much. And I'll start by acknowledging that I appreciate every journalist will have a different view of social media. After all, it's up to each of us to determine who we follow, how enthusiastically we tweet, and of course, how many pictures of adorable kittens we retweet amongst our serious political commentaries. Now, I've mostly worked up uh, at Parliament House here in the Fairfax Bureau for the web. Uh, for the last three years uh, in the Fairfax Bureau, I've, I've worked as a breaking news reporter and as a blogger. And this provides the basis for my views on how uh, social media has impacted upon political journalism. Some journalists in Canberra have wholeheartedly embraced social media to the point where it's one of the main ways they do their work each day. Others are a bit more grumpy about it, so to speak, and complain about how silly and shallow it is and say they shouldn't even have to have an account. I'd probably place myself somewhere in the middle of this spectrum. I joined Twitter about three years ago, and while I tweet every day for work, I'm not a 24-7 tweeter. As Dr Lang mentioned, at the moment uh, I write the Pulse live blog, where I work with Andrew Mears and Alex, Alex Ellinghausen rather, to cover the day as it happens in politics. This means having three TV screens, two computer screens, two telephones and the radio going all day to try and stay on top of what politicians are doing and saying. Alex and Andrew and I also tweet the highlights throughout the day and I keep a beady eye on what everyone else is saying on Twitter to see if people have comments or questions about what we're doing and to see what else is happening because if something breaks, it'll break on social media first, not via the news wires, not via radio or the 24 hour TV channels. Now there's no shortage of things that have changed in and around Australian politics and how it's covered over the past decade. Four different federal governments, a hung parliament, a brave new Senate, the internet and 24 hour news, as well as big revenue challenges and job cuts in the media industry have all shaped the process and output of political journalism. 
But social media has also had an impact on the way we do our jobs. I'm going to largely restrict my comments today to Twitter. While there are far less Twitter users than Facebook users in Australia, it's about 2.9 million on Twitter versus about 12 million on Facebook, I would argue that when it comes to political journalism, Twitter is the more interesting and more significant beast. Facebook and other social media like Google Plus are important for sharing articles and for driving uh, content, oh, sorry, driving traffic back to our websites. And there's certainly a, a difference between stories that will do well in the newspaper versus stories that will do well on the web and via social media. I'd argue that Twitter is the more important when it comes to agenda setting. In a relatively short space of time, Twitter has become part of the fabric here in the gallery. While it existed at the time of the 2007 election, it wasn't part of the political play. The 2009 Liberal leadership contest, however, between Malcolm Turnbull and Tony Abbott was a key moment for establishing Twitter here in Canberra. When journalists used Twitter to provide live updates as the race unfolded, it demonstrated how it can bring moving politics alive. Fast forward to today, and it's standard practice for MPs and journalists to all be on Twitter, although there are some exceptions, such as, say, Peter Harcher or the real Christopher Pine. So what is the impact of all this? Today, I'd like to talk about four effects that social media has had on political journalism here in Canberra. And the first of that, first of those, rather, is, is speed. As I mentioned before, one of Twitter's major features is that it's the speediest way to shout something from the rooftops. There's no middle person, there's no editor, no producer, no printer, it's just 140 characters and away you go. So journalists can now tweet of and about press conferences and question times as they happen. This can be saying what's happening, but it also can include analysis of what's happening as it happens. We can post stories or developments throughout the day, needing only our phones to do so. We can also post things that are interesting or quirky, but not necessarily worthy of an entire story in and of themselves. Things such as Clive Palmer has just hung up on me again, or Labor have just released a transcript of Malcolm Turnbull's interview with Alan Jones. Go figure. I think this enriches the coverage we provide to our readers. It allows us to give them more of the nuts and bolts of politics and can help us to build trust with audiences by making what we do seem a little bit less mysterious. Something that's also very useful for the blog and for the web is that MPs and other political players such as interest and community groups will react very quickly on social media if something's happening. And this can be a little bit less scripted than the usual talking points. So for example, earlier this week when Wayne Swan was kicked out of the chamber for 24 hours, by the time he got out of there, he'd already tweeted that he was happy to be kicked out for the sake of Labor's attack on the budget. And I think lies and economic lies were in there as well. Anyway, the point being here is that communication is of course not one way, but two. And this gets me to the second effect of social media on political journalism, which is feedback. Social media is not simply a way for journalists to talk quickly and directly to their audiences. It's a way for the audiences to talk back to them. And this works in several ways. Some are very welcome, others, for me anyway, are less welcome. Uh, Twitter provides a constant straw poll as we go along by logging on and having a look at hashtags, trending topics, things like uh, retweets and favourites. You can get a sense of whether something's getting a, a public reaction. Take for example, when Tony, Abbins, Tony Abbott said, I am a conservationist during a TV interview in Washington DC two weeks ago. I was watching the interview and at the end of it had to get in touch with my editor and decide whether we'd write a story about it and if so, out of the five or six topics, what would be the lead? Now when Tony Abbott called himself the C word, I tweeted his comment directly, almost as a note to myself. It immediately started to get a reaction, people were retweeting it. Some, uh, just out of interest, others were retweeting it crit uh, critically, but the point was there was a reaction happening. So this acted as a reality check for me. 
Uh, the most revealing thing about this interview was not the Prime Minister's nuanced comments about the relationship with China, it was his self-described environmental credentials. So in this way, social media um, is a means for journalists to get out of the so-called Canberra bubble. I'm not a self-hating journalist and I'm not saying that we always need to be corrected, but listening to politicians and other reporters talk politics all day long can obviously skew your worldview about what you think is important. Social media has also made it much easier for members of the public to tell journalists what they think of our work. Yes, you can still ring through from the switchboard, well, though I think a number of us are getting pretty wary about taking calls this way. Uh, you can send an email, you can comment on an article, and the Pulse usually, usually receives about 300 comments a day. But it's far easier just to tweet us. I don't want to dwell on online abuse here, other than to say that if your opening comment to me is an expletive about my IQ, I will probably just block you. But amongst the unpleasantness out there, there are also the people who get in touch to politely point out I've made a typo, to ask what the rep stores means, uh, to ask what the next steps in the double dissolution trigger might be, or simply to tell me that it's not fair to pick on Ricky Muir because he isn't a senator yet. Again, I think this helps ground what we do on the blog. It forces me to think about how someone who doesn't spend their whole day looking at politics will engage with what we're covering and I think it makes the final product more collaborative. In terms of feedback, I should probably also note that it's not just readers who are challenging what you're producing online. We're now seeing MPs taking to Twitter to dispute stories or interpretations of stories. And of course, we're seeing journalists start to dispute that right back. And I think this gets back to the nuts and bolts argument that I was making before. So an argument that might previously have happened over the phone and still happens over the phone is now happening in the public domain as well. And this is allowing readers to make up their, their own minds about things. Social media feedback works in a broader sense as well. And this leads to the third impact I'd like to discuss, which is story generation. The chat on social media can create stories in and of themselves. I seriously wonder whether Tony Abbott's Canadia uh, comment would have become such a big story without social media. The same goes for the mini hurricane that we had over the Prime Minister's press release that equated his, uh, well, included uh, D-Day commemorations uh, comments with uh, repealing the carbon tax. These just happened a couple of weeks ago. Both these stories were built around the reaction that the initial event uh, created and that reaction was generated through social media. I think more significantly, social media reaction played a large part in the analysis of Julia Gillard's misogyny speech. It took it out of the hands of the day-to-day -day politics, which was Julia Gillard responding to or defending Peter Slipper in his role as speaker, and turned it into something broader, which was a debate about, say, modern gender relations in Australia or what it's like to be the first female prime minister. I think it also played a role in suggesting to some mainstream outlets, including my own, that we pay more attention to the March in March rallies that occurred earlier this year. So social media doesn't just provide a reality check, it also provides another input into what the news actually is and what the news means. Stories can also, also emerge fully formed out of social media. And an example of this was the sexist menu that Mal Bruff that appeared at the Mal Bruff fundraiser last year that you may remember made some unsavoury comments about the Prime Minister and her anatomy. This only came to light after a staff member had posted the menu on Facebook and it took off from there. While social media, with social media, as this case demonstrates, with social media it's now almost impossible to suppress information in the way it was, say, in the 1980s when between Fairfax, Packer, Murdoch and the ABC, they had the media landscape just about tied up. So if they didn't cover something, then it didn't exist. It's real tree falling in a forest type stuff. Social media alone can't take credit for this information free for all. I think with the internet, sites like Crikey, uh, New Matilda with blogs, 
the information can all can get out there in a much easier way, but social media is increasing the ease with which information can get out there. It also means that someone who's not a journalist can put that information out there. The fourth impact of social media that I would like to talk about is a subset of this story generation. And this is because Twitter has provided a reliable news source of gaffe production in politics. Letting MPs loose on 140 characters has had some really interesting results. In November 2009, you might remember uh, when at the height of the Turnbull leadership crisis, Joe Hockey tweeted, hey team, read the ETS, give me your views please on the policy and political debate, I really want your feedback. In the careful dance that the leadership aspirants were doing, uh, Malcolm Turnbull for the ETS, uh, Tony Abbott against, Hockey's tweet made him look like he didn't have a view and it really made him look pretty silly at quite a serious time, at quite a critical time. Others across the political spectrum have also come unstuck in less subtle ways. In 2012, Labor backbencher Steve Gibbons got in trouble for tweeting, among other things, that Julie Bishop was a narcissistic bimbo. Brendan O'Connor last year received a similar black backlash when he suggested Tony Abbott's rural fire service volunteering was a stunt. And Liberal pollster Mark Texter became a high-profile Twitter quitter after his Filipino porn star comments, which were made in response to the revelations of the Indonesian phone tapping. Tweet gaff stories follow a similar and at times tedious trajectory. The tweet is noticed, the out outrage builds a bit like a cumulus cloud until the offender apologises or is forced to apologise and the tweet is taken down. All the while, the easy outrage that this creates distracts from whatever else we could be focusing on in politics that day. I do have a hunch, however, that MPs are becoming a bit savvier about the gaffe potential of social media and that parties are certainly aware of this, particularly around election times. And I don't think we're seeing quite as many oops moments as we were even a year ago. Here, I would also like to add in terms of generating stories that Twitter is no substitute for the old school journalistic techniques of contacts, sources, and an encyclopedic knowledge of Australian politics. While social media can provide good kindling and at times the odd worthy log, it doesn't fuel daily news production. Now, having talked about what I would class as four largely positive impacts of social media on political journalism, speed, feedback, story generation and gaffe production, I'd like to raise four questions about it. And the first of, the, first of these questions is, why are people really here? Many of those in and around politics are not just on Twitter to discuss policy in a big digital version of a Viennese coffee house. We're there because it's also an important part of maintaining a brand or a presence in political discussions. Journalists tweet stories they've written, MPs tweet about meetings they've had, about announcements they've made, uh, about famous people they've met. So a not insignificant part of social media is self-promotion. For journalists in an era of questionable job security, having as many social media followers as possible is also seen as a positive to employers. And comfortingly, it means you are self-sustaining as an information source even if you're not self-sustaining as a financial one. If only, hey. Um, as I alluded to at the start, um, an important part of being on Twitter is keeping an eye on what your colleagues and competitors are doing. And this brings me to the second question I have about social media and political journalism, which is, is there too much speed? Because everyone's constantly watching everyone else on social media, it's further compressing the time that a story is an exclusive. It means that as soon as someone tweets a story or tweets a new development, everyone else can just leap on that too. And if they don't, they probably have their news desks or their editors calling them to say or ask why they haven't. Given that Twitter is updating by the second, this can be dizzying. You have to remind yourself sometimes that instead of just watching social media with sort of goggles on or something, lest you miss something, perhaps you should just pick up the phone and talk to someone instead. I think the fact that we now tweet as we go through the day, and I think this is largely a good thing because 
audiences can be updated as we go. It means that unlike the old days, sort of 10 years ago, when you had the whole day to think about a story, to chase down queries you had, concerns you had, to get all the voices in there and arrive at a near to or your best product at the end of the day, you're providing readers with a draft as you go. And in some cases, that draft can turn out to be skewed or in some cases wrong. I think a good example this week is when we think about Clive Palmer's amazing press conference on Wednesday night. It actually would have been easier for all of us to wait the entire day and just tell everyone what the story was at, say, 11.30 at night. Now, I don't think we'll ever get that luxury, but I think this is one of the disadvantages uh, in this social media world. My third question about social media and journalism could also be asked more generally about the internet, and that is, is it too distracting? Another way Twitter has impacted on certainly my journalism is that it's a powerful procrastination tool. While writing this presentation, one minute I was searching for a particular tweet about the carbon tax, and the next I found myself immersed in an article about the seven reasons why it's terrible to own a fringe. <laughs> the next I knew it, I was looking at pictures of deli goods that someone bought last weekend at my local IGA. Perhaps this says more about my self-discipline than the evils of Twitter, but I do wonder if the productivity we gain through social media's speed is being lost through the many distractions that it also provides. The fourth and final question I have about social media is one that has been asked before, but one that I don't think we've quite answered yet. I think it's a pretty difficult one to answer. So that's as compelling as Twitter can seem, who is tweeting and how representative are they? No matter how conscious you are to follow people on Twitter from across the political spectrum, your followers list is not a carefully chosen focus group and it's not a scientifically sampled poll. We self-select who we follow. And the most retweeted comments or the people with the most followers are not necessarily the most correct people. In Australia, a 2012 study by Accenture Media, which is owned by Media Monitors, found that while Twitter was a reasonably sound bellwether of public opinion, it does lean to the left and is more vitriolic and polarised than talkback radio. A Pew poll of US tweeters last year also found that Twitter conversations can be at times more liberal and more conservative than survey responses. This is not to dismiss what's going on here, and it could be argued that particularly in Australia, Twitter serves as a bit of a counterbalance to talk back, which has been found to be more right-leaning. But I think what journalists and other people thinking about what social media means need to be mindful of is that we can't necessarily correlate or directly correlate a few retweets with voter sentiment. So if I could conclude by way of saying that social media is an unwieldy and mixed bag for political journalism. It is both liberating and informative um, that if individuals now have their own platforms. It also facilitates a conversation between journalists and audiences that enables the two groups to understand each other better. But social media does have its drawbacks. It speeds everything up in ways that are not always conducive to sanity. And at times it can serve as a distraction to the day's news. And as I've said, it can also be very distracting at a personal level as well. Yet I can't imagine a time in the future when social media, in some form or other, won't continue to play a part in political journalism because it's too useful and too addictive not to. Thanks very much. Thank you, Judith. That was a fantastic introduction. Can I do a quick straw poll? Show me, uh, by a show of hands, uh, how many of you participate in social media? You tweet or you blog? It's pretty good. And how many of you have never sent a tweet or posted a blog? Yeah, we, I, I've learned a lot already and I'm going to, hoping to learn more. And I'd like you to welcome Greg Jericho to the podium. Thank you. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, fortunately, Judith and I are uh, taking slightly different uh, aspects. Judith, uh, given her role, has got a bit of more of a practical view of it. I'm sort of taking a little bit more of a, a theoretical 
uh, view, but I've got hopefully some good uh, practical examples in there. What I'm doing, and my, the, the topic of my lecture is social media and political journalism, the contested space. Even though I blog on economics and, and write mostly about economics, my actual uh, PhD that I did was in English literature. And like all good PhD students, I had a favourite theorist, and my favourite theorist was Mikhail Bakhtin, a Russian literature critic who did some great work uh, despite Stalin not wanting him to do such great work. And he had some theories about language that I think have some really good relevance for what, what's happening now in, with social media and political journalism and traditional media. See, Bakhtin, his basic theory was that language is never unitary, that the modern language has evolved from a primitive monoglossia to a heteroglossia. Now, what he meant by heteroglossia is there's lots of different voices, there's different jargons, there's different slang, Every, lots of different groups sort of contributing their own um, aspect to the whole language. He, for example, would argue that the dictionary might contain the vocabulary of English, but he, he would argue that it is not out of a dictionary that the speaker gets his or her words. Instead of the static nature of the dictionary, for Bakhtin, language was fluid and organic, and he wrote that the word in living conversation is directly, blatantly oriented towards a future answer word, and that we say things expecting a response, and this is crucial with social media because that's really what it's about, I think. I think that's what the key thing is. Yes, it speeds up everything because we're tweeting the moment we see something, but for me, the key impact of social media on political journalism and on all journalism is that it has introduced this dialogic nature, that language has become a dialogue, the language of political commentary and political reporting has become a dialogue, and it's not just between Dennis Shanahan and Lenore Taylor and Laura Tingle as it was previously, it is now between those players and the audience. The audience has shifted from being the passive reading the newspaper and really that's as far as it got, they might write a letter to the editor, to now being able to respond either with a tweet, with a blog, with a comment on Facebook that can actually generate a dialogue. Now this has some traps and some concerns for the traditional media people because if meaning and truth of things and their version of events is now contested, that diminishes their authority. and when you're a newspaper, your authority is pretty important in actually getting people to buy your product. If your product is, doesn't have this sort of kernel of authority, people are less inclined to do it. Now, the Australian blog sphere started in around you know, the early 2000s, and it was a fairly small thing, but it really started getting going around 2006, 2007 in the run-up to the, the election of 2007. And the big area where there was a lot of growth was in what's called cephology, where it was commenting on blogs about polls, about news poll, about Nielsen poll and so forth. Now, the Australian which ran news poll at the time really did not like this. And they responded on July 12th, 2007 with, a, with an actual editorial about these blogs, these blogs which were actually read by hardly anyone. This was really before Twitter, Facebook was sort of there, but basically you had to know about these blogs to even know that they were existing. But what these blogs, bloggers were doing was they were criticising how the Australian was reporting news poll and how they were interpreting it. And so the Australian fought back with this real sense of saying, and it wasn't just sort of a criticism, it was trying to take ownership again of meaning and of truth that we the newspaper, we, the members of the press gallery, we know the truth of things. Our version of the truth is really the only truth. It starts off by saying, the measure of good journalism is objectivity and a fearless regard for the truth. And, it's <laughs> and, and it suggests that you know, the online news commentary doesn't have this. Now, it went down to the the in the second box there, one of the greatest lines of all time in any Australian newspaper editorial, where it says, unlike Crikey and these other blogs, we understand news poll because we own it. <laughs> so you can see it's not just a case of we 
our words are, are true because we've got the experience of Dennis Shanahan or whoever it was who was writing about it. It's because we actually own the truth. And you can see it's this real sort of fight against how dare these other voices try and stratify or spread out different versions of what something is. Now, it didn't just happen in Australia. It's, and it's in America, in the run-up to the 2012 election, there are a lot of Again, these sophologists, people like Nate Silver writing a lot of blogs, ironically writing them on the New York Times and the Washington Post and, and other websites, where they basically declared the election was over in about June. You know? And so there was a long time to go before the election, but these guys were basically saying, well, look, if you look at all the polls, you look at how they're reacting and everything, there's no way Obama's going to lose. Now, Peggy Noonan, writing the day before the election, uh, in the Wall Street Journal. She reacted really in this sort of sense that this traditional journalist in sense of how can you know, how can you guys sitting at home in front of a computer know the truth? We're out there on this sweaty, cramped bus following these guys around, eating crap food for three months. We know the truth. And she argued that who knows what to make of the weighting of the polls and the assumptions of who to vote? Who knows the depth and breadth of each party's turnout? And she argued, that maybe the American people were quietly cooking something up, something we don't know about. I think they are, and it is this, a Romney win. <laughs> now, here was Simon Jackman on Huffington Post. Here was his predictions the day before of, of uh, what would happen with the election, and there's what happened. It pretty much happened as was expected. He actually did know what the people were thinking. But it was this real sense of how can bloggers do this? They're not doing it the right way. How can they own the truth? And if if a blogger is able to declare the election over three months out, then why is anyone going to bother reading our coverage of the election when basically the race has already run? Now, it doesn't just apply to polling uh, that they are concerned about the truth. There was a wonderful example in 2010, The Australian, which wrote a, a story saying that Rio Tinto shelves billions in projects. Now, a couple hours uh, in the morning, Rio Tinto, perhaps thinking this might affect their share price, put out a statement to the stock exchange saying, no decision to shelve projects. Now you might think, well, there we go, the meaning is pretty clear there, the Australian's going to have to back down, but of course not. This was how they responded with saying that Rio Tinto reaffirms reviewing, change from shelves, but to re reviewing, but within the article, and unfortunately you can't see it there because it was a bit down, the journalist wrote that uh, in an announcement to the Australian Securities Exchange today, Rio said there had been no final decision by its board to, quote, shelve any projects in Australia following the announcement of the government's proposed new mining tax. In the Australian pocket Oxford Dictionary, the word shelve is defined as, quote, to put aside, especially temporarily. And they use that to justify that their original story was actually correct that they were actually using shelf to mean that, not shelve what Rio Tinto were actually meaning when they were saying the word shelve. It's this sense of the words we use are the correct words and they're really the only interpretation of meaning that you can have. Now, another example was uh, with the Andrew Bolt case when uh, he was um, uh, done for the Racial Discrimination Act. And Chris Kenny at the time was writing on it, and again, it's this sense of not just sort of arguing the toss of, you know, whether the act is right or wrong. It really came down to the truth and, and who gets to determine what truth is. And Kenny wrote that um, the Justice Mordecai Broomberg said some of Bolt's words meant more than their literal meaning, and that while he accepted the literal meaning of some of Bolt's mitigating fra phrases, he found Bolt did not believe them. And he goes on to say that, so now when airing opinions on matters of public interest, Australians are subject to sanction by a court according to a judge prescribing extra meaning to the words we, we use or denying our sincerity in the use of other words. And Kenny wrote, if that is not frighteningly Orwellian, nothing is, and may it please the court, that is exactly what I'm meant to write, no more, no less. Now, this kind of view was being parodied back in the 19th century. I mean, Lewis Carroll was writing it through the looking glass of, of Winnie, uh, of Humpty Dumpty, saying, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. And it's a case of, 
clearly we've kind of moved beyond this and knowing that you can't just say, oh, look, I was just kidding when I said that, you know, you can't take it a different way to what I said. And given that Chris Kenny has just been involved in the defamation hearing where he took a different view of what was said by the Chaser guys, um, I think he's kind of on board with actually that view of what language is. Especially when you think that back in March, Chris Kenny wrote that he is quitting Twitter, whereas if you actually go on Twitter, you'll find that Chris Kenny is still very much there, so who the hell knows what meeting really is anymore. <laughs> but it's a case of sometimes with social media that, that the criticism will then be, oh look, it's just opinion. And it certainly is true, there is a hell of a lot of opinion on social media, on blogs, on Twitter, on Facebook. But what we often find as well is that the media will try and suggest that their opinion is actually the truth. Now this happened back in 2012, the Australian put out a top 50 most influential uh, people in Australian politics, you know, standard sort of list, everyone's got a good opinion and everything, you know, good discussion. But what struck me when I was reading uh, when they were launching this list was that they tried to explain how they came up with it. And the journalist wrote, the list went through a multi-stage assessment process. A long list was compiled and considered by an editorial committee comprising Australian's editor-in-chief Chris Mitchell, editor Clive Matheson, political editor Dennis Shanahan, and online national affairs editor Ben Packham. The list was then culled and further soundings taken before the committee convened again to sign off on the final document. You know, the sense of we're signing off on something like it's an audit process and we've now got the final unquestioned document of who is the most powerful in Australian politics ranked in the correct order. It's a sense of never sort of considering that really what you've got is four journalists who sat around and came up with the, their opinion and that's no more weighty or less than if I got four of my mates who are very interested in Australian politics to also come up with an order. There's no sort of sense of your truth is more true than anything else. Now, a classic example, and, and Judith uh, referred to this, was the misogynist speech. Now, when this was reported, the press gallery reported as, is actually quite correctly, they reported it from a political angle. But social media, and by this I really don't mean Twitter. Twitter was kind of trapped up in that social media and that political vortex as well, but um, sort of more the blogs and, and especially Facebook looked at it from a completely different angle. They didn't really give a stuff about the politics. They didn't care whether Julia Gillard's speech would improve the news poll rating or anything like that. It had nothing to do with that. It was purely here as a woman basically standing up to a man. And it was done in that context, the context of every woman who has had a crappy boss or something or has had to you know, put up with something like this from someone, here was someone saying what we wanted to always wish we could say and better than we really could ever say it. And that's a perfectly valid version of interpreting that speech and just as interpreting the political aspects of the speech as the, as the um, press gallery did is also valid. But instead of the many of the news organisations then sort of realised, oh, we've missed an aspect of this. What they did was to fight back and say, no, your version of that speech was not true. It was not accurate. You've got it wrong. We've got it right. We know what's right. And here's Dennis Shanahan, Paul Kelly, Christopher Pearson, Chris Kenny, Peter Van Ons, and, and so on, to tell you why you've got it wrong to the ludicrous point of Dennis Shanahan going on Jezebel and reading the comments and passing them to let us know this is really what the commenters on Jezebel website are, are talking about. It was this absurd sort of sense, instead of just being able to say, yeah, actually, you know, we've missed this, so let's actually include this aspect of meaning of something. It's this continual sense of saying, no, there is no other meaning than what we have obscured. Have, um, stated there is, and if we've, once we've stated it, we'll never acknowledge that we're wrong, we'll ne never acknowledge that we've missed something. And it's just something that really doesn't work in a social media environment because social media does not allow for a unitary meaning of words, of events, of truth. Now, I'll give you a nice little example that I was actually involved with. Um, oh, sorry, and I'm just... Uh, even, even uh, uh, one of the things that happened as a result of this misogyny speech is Macquarie University changed 
or broaden the meaning of what misogyny meant. And of course that got criticised, suddenly the dictionary was wrong, we couldn't even cope with the dictionary static version because suddenly dictionaries weren't static. Who knew that the English language actually evolved, you know? <laughs> but an example that I was involved with which was really about this contestability of truth, of meaning of, of events, involved uh, the G20 summit in, in Mexico that Julia Gillard went to in June of 2012. It was reported like this, uh, this was in the Daily Telegraph and it was reported similarly in the Australian and a few other uh, media outlets, even, even the ABC, that Julia Gillard had been slapped down at the summit by the President of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barrasso. Now I read the article and I thought, oh yeah, it was probably the standard thing of Gillard got mentioned you know, in one sentence and it's been kind of hyped up and all that and I thought, nothing more of it, you know, the standard thing, Australian journalists over in a foreign country have got to get some sort of an Australian angle on anything. But then I was, I was on Twitter, as, as I always am, and Annabelle Crabb tweeted this. Just listen to the entire Barroso press conference. His rant about criticism of Europe was in response to Canada, not Julia Gillard. And she then tweeted a link to the speech, which I was one of the 433 people to bother actually listening to. And it was true. Julia Gillard didn't get a mention. The response that had been used to that Julia Gillard is slapped down was actually a response to a question from a Canadian journalist asking about Stephen Harper. And so I wrote a blog. Uh, this is just on my, you know, my, my own blog page. And it was in the context of that day there'd been a number of job cuts by Fairfax. And I just wrote a thing about how I was when everyone was sort of complaining about media and, and, and readership and, and you know, people not paying for it, I was writing in the context of I'm finding it hard to justify buying media, buying newspapers when I'm not trusting what's actually being reported in them and that actually trust is a fairly crucial thing and if newspapers are losing that and one of the reasons they're losing that is because we can actually go watch the raw data, we can go watch the speech and get our own view. We don't need Simon Benson to write about the speech for us to actually find out what the speech was. If we've got the time, we can go listen to it and draw our own conclusions. So I wrote about uh, this, and then a couple of days later, Simon uh, Benson wrote on his blog on the Daily Telegraph's page that anyone who thinks Julia Gillard's lecture to Europe went down well with the leaders of the largest economic blog in the world obviously wasn't in Los Cabos this week. Again, that sort of sense of how would you know the truth of something? You, you weren't there, you weren't part of it. You can't do this unless you're actually a member of the press gallery. If you're a member of this, of a, you know, write for a newspaper, then you're able to know what the truth is. And he had this odd sort of thing right down the bottom where he said if only armchair experts like former Labor staffer Annie O'Rourke had actually gone to the G20 instead of Googling it, they too may have learned something. Now, I was wondering why the mention of Annie O'Rourke, and that was because she had tweeted to him, Simon Benson, please read this, they, you are the reason people don't believe they should pay for media. And you can see there he's favourited the tweet. And the link was to my blog. Now, an interesting thing, he didn't mention me, he mentioned Annie O'Rourke, but that's okay. One of the upshots of this, you think, oh, it might end there, but Nick Green and a few other people made a complaint to the press council about the reporting of this speech. Um, I had nothing to do with the reporting. I really don't care about complaining to the press gallery. If I think something's wrong, I'll just write a blog about it. <laughs> but one of the things was they cited my blog coverage of, of this speech in, in their sort of uh, submission to the press council. And the press council agreed with them, which is why if you go to the website now, instead of just seeing that, you see this. And to me, this was a, a wonderful example of this collision between social media and traditional media. And the best thing about it wasn't really because of my um, involvement, but because it actually all started with Annabelle Crabb, a very, I guess you could say, um, foundation member of the traditional media, you know, very much, you know, ABC, before that, Fairfax, you know, really sort of a member of traditional media, but it was her use of social media that alerted me to this speech, 
which enable me to then write something which then cannonballed and on towards this complaint being upheld by the press gallery. And it's this real sense of that would never have happened were it not for social media. I wouldn't have seen the tweet by Annabelle Crabb because that wouldn't have existed. I probably wouldn't have been able to watch the speech on the internet because I probably would have, before social media really, there was all just dial up and I wouldn't have bothered doing it. And as a result, the version of truth of that speech would have been what was reported in the newspaper. That contestability of, of meaning and of truth really is absolutely given a, a real sort of turbocharge through social media. Now this doesn't mean that social media always ends with us getting a better version of the truth. Classic example was with the Boston Marathon bombings. When that happened, social media went into overdrive. They were going to solve the case. And you went on Reddit and you could see they'd found all photographs and that worked out it was a missing Brown student from Brown University who did it, or that perhaps it was someone holding the bag. And rather stupidly, the traditional media got caught up in this, bit, well, the New York Post anyway, and they put this on the front page because these guys had been found in the Reddit forums that these guys are the suspicious ones. These guys, perhaps, you know, this guy on the right, his bag could be holding a, a um, pressure cooker that could have the bomb in it. You know, a real sort of absurd style thing. Instead, instead of the sort of the traditional media standing back and going, well, that could be a bit iffy, they tried to replicate it. And now they're getting sued for very, a great deal of money by these two guys because, of course, they weren't involved at all. What I view, and this is kind of to conclude, what I view the interaction between social media, traditional media, and, and all of that together is a bit like how data is used for the unemployment rate. What happens, the ABS puts out, there's original data, the raw data, the actual number of people who were unemployed that month. And then they put out the seasonally adjusted version, which takes into the fact that there's always a lot more people unemployed in January every year because it's holidays and businesses aren't hiring. So that's kind of not, the original data really isn't real. They have to sort of take that into account. And so they do a seasonally adjusted version, which is kind of trying to get a bit more context to things. And then they also have the trend line, which is a rolling sort of 13 month view of things, a real sort of let's just step back and not get too excited about things. What I often view is that Twitter and a lot of social media is a lot of the original data. It's raw, it's rushed, it's, this is what's happened. Now, it is actually true, but if you're reporting and that that is the only truth, well, you're missing out on something. You're missing out on the context of the seasonally adjusted. And perhaps the media should be trying to more give us that view. But the thing is sometimes the trend version is better, but sometimes the seasonally adjusted gives us a bit more of indication that, oh, we've turned a corner, whereas the trend is a bit more slow about doing these things. But they're all true, all three of those are true, but it's a real contest of what is the best version of what is the context that we should be focusing on. And I think that's where we are with social media and traditional media and the reporting of politics. It's this real sense of everyone trying to sort of contest between the original, the seasonally adjusted, the trend. They're all true, but there's a good debate to be had there. And if it's a good debate where journalists and people on social media are aware that their truth is not the only truth or the only version of events, we're going to actually get a more full and a better picture of things. And I think if you're a journalist who can't cope with that, then I think you really should think about getting to another profession because social media is never going away. And this contest of ideas, this contest of what truth is, is here to stay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Very deep. We've, we've got a, a great range of uh, topics to, uh, to consider. And because our speakers have both been excellent timekeepers, we've got the perfect amount of time for some questions and discussions. And the rule I'm going to impose today, like a, a tweet, 140 characters, <laughs> 
all comments and questions must be short. So if you have a question or a comment, I'd invite you to come to one of the microphones. There are two downstairs and one upstairs in the gallery. And um, let me start with you, sir. You're always quick to the microphone, and, uh, and I commend thank you, you for it. Uh, thank you very much. You've reminded me of the truth that was once published in Victoria, <laughs> full of scandal. Then the other one was the Bible, known as the age. I was brought up on the age. But then somebody came along. The one who came along, and this is my question, is Neil Ferguson, a Scottish financial historian. And his question was this. What is the framework? What is the context of financial management on all political commentary. What is the financial context of all political commentary? Who owns the media? Would, would either of you like to make a brief response? Judith, you're actually on salary, so you can actually talk. <laughs> I'm a poor freelancer. I know, but my employers may not be keen on me talking about who owns the media and who doesn't. <laughs> That's probably the difference. Um, I think that's... We could take it as a comment. Could, could. I mean, I think that is interesting, though, in terms of social media. Obviously, Australia has, even though the media landscape in some ways has diversified with the internet I was talking about since, say, the 80s, it's still a very small media landscape. And so with social media, we're not just relying on people with a lot of money to, to, to give us information. And I mean, I think that's a positive thing. I don't know if that answers the question. It, but. It, for me, it also brings to mind, though, and it's that whole thing of trust and who is the person tweeting and knowing actually who they are. And, and quite often people use pseudonyms, and I certainly use, used a pseudonym. But it's a case of, um, you know, especially in America, um, not so much in Australia, but there are examples of sort of um, um, astroturfing using sort of social media to suggest that there is this groundswell of of view where actually it's just companies sort of trying to do that. So it certainly does bring, just because they're on social media doesn't mean they're, they're not owned by somebody. Thank you, sir. Greg made some really interesting, interesting comments that social media is a lot more than just Twitter. Uh, it's really interesting picking up Judah's point that when we talk about social media in Australia, some of the audience seem to, I get the reaction, I get the sense that their reaction is, oh my goodness, it's happening so quickly, but we're so, far, we're so slow compared to what's happening stateside. What do you think of um, broadcast phenomenons like, um, say, The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, or even The Young Turks Network? Do you think we're big enough for those sorts of things to happen down under? Well, the evidence so far would be that uh, outside of uh, the ABC, no. Um, you know, the hamster wheel kind of tries to do it and, and um, Forgotten his name, um, McCullough. Um, so you've forgotten his name. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's you know it, it costs a lot of money to these shows. You need a lot of research. You know, when I worked on the the hamster wheel, my job was pretty much just to kind of almost do what Judith does and just look at the the raw footage of all um, you know all the Parliament House sort of uh, interviews and and read every newspaper and all that just to find sort of, you know, something funny in there. And I was just one of the people who was doing, you know, they were watching every TV show all the time. And it's an amazing amount of resources. And the audience, you know, you, if you can get a million people watching, you're doing extremely well. And um, I think commercial networks want just can't justify it, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I would love McAuliffe to be every night in Australia and we're sort of, it, he's a patchy commodity, I think, um, mm. at, at best. And uh, I think other political comedy shows sort of haven't lasted the distance. I, I'm an optimist on this one because I think we need, I think we need more satire and a sort of an antidote to the news. But uh, yeah, I'm, I think we should not hold our breath on that one. Okay, thanks. Next question. And is that you, Gilsey? <laughs> that, that, that was incredible. Two, two questions. One is, um, how much has social media opened up the world to extraordinary conspiracy theorists who see politics through that, uh, that prism? 
I mean, I'll, I'll, Greg's last comment I thought was very interesting. Of course, once upon a time we used to think that the daily newspaper was the first draft of history. Now it's Twitter is the first draft of history and maybe newspapers are the ones that have to step back. Interesting your comments on those two things, especially the conspiracy. We saw it with Julia Gillard and a lot of bloggers out there running conspiracy theories about her and uh, Wilson, the AWU person. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fertile ground for conspiracy theory. I mean, just think of the um, Malaysian Airlines aircraft um, going, you know, if you're on Twitter, there were the number of theories being put out by nameless people or by Rupert Murdoch as well, <laughs> suggesting, you know, terrorism and, and everything was involved. And you're right, it, it, and that's, I guess, what my sort of point about uh, sort of that original raw data is that, you know, you always need to be, when you're reading Twitter, to be aware of that, especially with things like, you know, you know, when Nelson Mandela was seriously ill, God, there were, there was so many people desperate to be the first to tweet that he died. And it's kind of like, you know, I'm pretty sure when he actually does die, we'll all know through an official source, you know, there's no need to sort of think this announcement must be it. And I, um, it's always the case with, with when you're using social media to be aware that what it is it's, and what type of media. And just as when you read any magazine, you always view it with the, in the context. If you're reading New Weekly, you might view a story in there about someone's friend saying that someone's marriage is on the rocks. You might view that a bit differently than if that story was put up on the ABC website. So you've always got to, I think, be aware of the context and not think social media is perfect. And I'd say I think politics is full of conspiracy theories. I mean, staffers and MPs are constantly peddling conspiracy theories about the other side. So in one sense, um, we're sort of used to that. And I think that the Julia Gillard AWU example is a really good one of that has leaped the conspiracy theory fire line, if you like. We've now got a royal commission looking at this stuff. And it's some of this stuff is now being seriously looked at, whether or not it's true. So that shows you the power of this stuff because some of these blogs were very persistent about the things they were saying about Julia Gillard. And so that shows that power. I think also just in question time, if I'm, I know if I'm tweeting something about something Pine has said, a whole lot of people will come back and rah, rah, rah Christopher Pine, this, this and this. So there's a sort of low level conspiracy theory stuff going all the time. But I kind of get back to the fact that in politics, people are constantly putting out very um, sexy stories, if you like, about the opposition, and you've sort of got to filter through that in the same way. We've probably got time for two more, so I'll invite you to ask your question. Um, I was just wondering, do either of the speakers have a view about um, the change to the rollout of the NBN, given that it facilitates the engagement through being able to watch videos fast, being able to post things fast, and whether you think um, owning the news has an impact on how it's being rolled out or a concern perhaps, um, Judith, about productivity. <laughs> is, Always my concern. <laughs> is impact, or whether it really is just about the money. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a particular view about the sort of timing and rollout of the MBN and how that sort of relates to people's sort of social media use and so forth or, or their ability to... I mean, of course, it will make watching videos easier, and that's that's great, thanks to the government. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have a particular view about that. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's too much of an impact. One of the great things about social media, and in fact about a lot of the internet, is that it's actually a very much a written medium. It's about writing, which actually doesn't take up much megabytes or megabits or whatever it is to do. Um, and sure, you know, it, being able to watch Question Time live on a live stream or even this on a live stream certainly is helps if, you, if you've got uh, broadband. But for a lot of the social media use and the actual discussion about reporting, it, it actually doesn't really need too much uh, bandwidth going on. But it, um, because it, it, it really comes down, and even, you know, like when I started my blog, I had a dial up, I think, and, uh, you know, it. It certainly is easier and better when you've got the fast uh, broadband, but I, it's not too much of a um, barrier. Last question. I'd be interested in the uh, 
reaction of both speakers to the clerk's question, uh, my impression was that roughly two thirds of the people here indicated that they were not using social media. And in particular, whether that's an indication that there are still a lot of people in the community who prefer serious, in-depth, considered journalism to these uh, quick, short, pithy, immediate responses. Can I start on that one just very briefly? Yeah. <coughs> you know, for, from my point of view, it's a, a question of lack of technical facility and lack of time to uh, enjoy the uh, medium. Um, but let me pass to the panel. I think one of the things with Twitter is it tends, I, I know studies have been done in the US, so I'm not sure how much here it does tend to be younger people on social media, although there are large take ups of social media amongst people over 50. Um, I think that is an issue in terms of the point I touched on at the end of my talk about how inclusive the conversation is and who's, who's not there as part of the conversation, and I do think that's really important. I think that. Twitter in particular is a mix because it might be a link to a really interesting long depth, long read article. It's not necessarily, I mean, a big part of it is those quick fire things. Tony Abbott just said this, oh my God. Um, but it, it does have links to other articles. It is also a conversation, uh, as Greg was talking about, it is about people interacting with things, revising what has been said. So I think there is a more in-depth side to social media than, say, the 140 characters would suggest. Yeah, absolutely. I, for me, the great thing about Twitter is is the conversations I have with people who are a hell of a lot smarter than me who can point me in the direction of things and articles and uh, academic pieces that I, I probably wouldn't have come across if I wasn't on Twitter. And, and in terms of... It is very much a generational thing and, and certainly... Um, older people are less likely to be using it than younger people, but even that's kind of changing. And you have to realise we've got people now in, in university who can barely remember not being able to access the internet by phone. And it, it's a fundamental change that has occurred, and it's little wonder that there are some people who are sort of struggling to keep up with it. But as I say, don't be fooled into thinking, oh, it's just people tweeting about cats or sort of things. It, it can be if that's all you want to do, but it's actually, it's an amazing tool for actually finding that in-depth discussion that you actually might really enjoy, and, but that you're actually missing out on because you're thinking, oh, I'm only, I'll get that if I just use the newspapers, where actually some of these blogs are written by Nobel laureates and everything that are incredibly interesting that you only really become aware of through social media. Mm. On that note, I'm afraid our time is up. I know we, would, we could continue this discussion uh, for quite some time. It's been a, a fabulous session. Thank you all for coming and please give a hand to our panel. And look out for our next uh, episode next month, I think, July. Yeah. <coughs>